Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Well, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hmm. Well, there's a spirit of prophecy was upon the face of the meeting. You might not have realized that God was moving and speaking to hearts and spoke to my heart. It's good, you know, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And when people began begin to move back into liberty, that flow comes. And uh, it's good to know that we're beginning to climb again. You know, I was beginning to wonder if we were always going to remain in a valley. Some of you looked as though you wanted to. And God's beginning to cause us to ascend. Hallelujah. And it's about time to... Um, we want to go on now with the glorious truth of the um, priesthood. And um, I just want to say something about it before I begin. I've never heard it preached myself. I've never ever been taught it. Uh, and I've read books that are all wrong. So there we are. And George got me another one and it's even worse. But I um, uh, picked it up in Birmingham, I think, didn't you, George? Dear, oh dear. Enough to give you apoplexy, that book. <laughs> I won't give it to you back unless you want to read rubbish. Um, I studied it um, because there's so many... Man's opinion is so stupid, isn't it? When you start reading what man says, they're absolutely cockeyed. And, you know, I began to think, you know, when I looked at it, I, it all went inside. I said, yuck, this is wrong. So I began to just search the scriptures to convince myself that what I knew by the spirit was so in the scriptures and of course it was i find the two always agree hallelujah and we're going on with exodus 28 and uh you remember um the two stones uh verse 10 six of their names on one stone and six names of the rest on the other according to their birth. Do you remember the onyx stones which were upon the shoulder? I suppose, the, are they epaulets? Uh, I, I don't know. That's what they call them, don't they? Um, upon the shoulder. And there they were in onyx stone and the names. And you'll remember that there are two names that appear there that aren't amongst the tribes. That is Joseph and Levi. Now Joseph and Levi, according to birth, were there, but don't appear on the breastplate. And we're going to study the breastplate, but I just want to mention um, very significant things that I think I mentioned last time about those names that appear on the shoulder. First, it was according to birth, therefore they would appear there according to birth irrespective of anything that they did. Secondly, all had the same value. In other words, all of them were in onyx stone, weren't they? They were all engraven in onyx stone. So they had exactly the same value by birth. All also were equally held up by Aaron. In other words, they were upon his shoulders. So all were upon his shoulders. And uh, there was no variation in the value before God of any of the names. All right? And you'd find that in Galatians, if you just want to turn to it, Galatians chapter 3. Uh, just put it in perspective, if you want it in the New Testament. Uh, just in case you're one of these silly people that thinks the Old Testament's out of date, um, in verse 26, uh, 
This is the explanation of it. For, verse 26, For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. All right, you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That is how we become children of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. Alright? You follow that? Now that is the basis of birth for everyone. Faith is our basis of birth. And that faith is the same for every individual. It doesn't vary. We all need that faith to come to birth. And therefore, the place on the shoulder which is according to birth is always the same with everyone. No one gets more and some less, all get the same. Same regeneration, same birth. And now we want to go on to verse 15. And here we come to the beautiful piece. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it gold, blue, purple, and scarlet. And fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Now you'll notice that immediately that it's identical in materials to the ephod. Alright? The breastplate's identical to the ephod. Four square it shall be being doubled. That means that it was a span uh, let me oh, <laughs> a span shall be the length thereof and a span the breadth thereof. It was actually folded so that it was a span, both length and breadth. And a span, in case you don't know, I didn't say spam, I said span, is um, nine inches, all right? Roughly nine inches, uh, give or take an inch. Um, but it was square. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an imith. Quite right. And the fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. In lost my teeth. They Shall all, they shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names. Like the engravings of the signet, every one with his name shall be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the end, rhythm work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and thou shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate, and thou shalt put the two ribbon chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two ribbon chains thou shalt fasten in the two ouches, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And the two other rings of gold um, thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue. And remember, blue speaks of grace. So first you have gold, which connects to the shoulders, which speaks of being lifted up to God by birth. And then you have blue, which speaks of man's relationship, which is blue lace, which is grace. All right, reaching down to man. Um, that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron, and the, the reason it was so intricately worked in, was the breastplate became part of the ephod. It never came off. Understand it. The, e the breastplate was an intricate part of the ephod. Alright? And Aaron shall bear 
That's why it was be not loosed from the ephod, you see. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart continually before the Lord. Alright, we want to stop there. That's the breastplate. Now there are some mysteries. What does it all mean? Well, great is the mystery of godliness. And if you knew what it all meant, it would cease to be a mystery. However, we know what some of it means, and what we know, we shall share on. And what we don't know, we won't conjecture. Alright? And um, if we go to um, uh, the breastplate first of all, let me explain to you that the stones were put in the breastplate. Now, they were put according to what? Name. Now, name is synonymous with what? That's right. You see? Now, first of all, on the shoulders, it didn't matter. That was according to birth. Now, it's according to nature. And there's a great difference between your birth and your nature, isn't there? I mean, I presume most of you were born. Did anyone get found under a gooseberry bush? No? Yeah, you are. Now, you all got born, huh? And uh, you got born all the same way. Well, maybe not. Well, someone might have come feet first. I doubt it. But um, you basically are all born the same way. But your natures are different. But your births are the same. And when you were born, you all cried out and you got breath. You see, but that didn't really make your nature, did it? Your nature was intrinsically there, but your birth was all on the same basis. I mean, no one knew just how horribly you developed. I mean, it took years to find out. Uh, and your nature developed over a period of time. And thank God when you got born again, it began to change. What a relief for us all and may it continue to do so, hmm. especially with me. And the, the thing is that that's the way God, God deals, but the birth is the same for everyone. And we need to understand that in the breastplate, it was according to the nature. Now, you will notice that there were precious stones on the breastplate, if you look with me. Um, you will remember, and thou shalt set um, in, set it in settings of stone, four rows of stones. Alright, the first row, and then it goes on to talk about the stones. And there was a first row, a second row. Now, it doesn't say whether it was a first row going downwards, or a first row going across, does it? That's the first mystery. It doesn't tell you. And they were four square as well. So there we are. Doesn't tell you. And the other interesting thing about it is that there's no way that you can make um, carve into certain of these stone signets. Can't do it. Because of their toughness and brittleness. What happens if you hit them? That's correct, isn't it? So, you have to begin to think. Now, if you were like Brother Slemming, who wrote this book, you'd believe, I'm just giving you an example, you'd believe that these stones were the true stones, but they're not, you see. Because the Hebrew words which are used to describe the stones, describe stones which don't have basic um, value in our day and age. You see, they were a value. Things change value, and over times and periods and years, you'll find things change. I mean, uh, they valued gold uh, 
moderately and now they value it tremendously you know gold goes up in value once oil was a wretched thing that you kind of wiped off your feet and tried to get off I suppose and now it's got great value because some idiot made the motor car and thank God for it um, you know but at the time when it was there it hadn't got value because no one had learned what to do with it I suppose they know how to burn lamps with it but I mean they hadn't really learned what to do with it and, and therefore it didn't have value now in uh, the ancient lands in Egypt many of the uh, things that our translators have given us have no equivalent and to be honest we don't really know what they were because they don't exist I mean certain of the Hebrew words are used four times in the whole of the Old Testament and we don't just know what rightly what they were now if you spend your time like a dear brother Fleming working out which nature should go to which stone because you see you can take let's take one like a sapphire or a diamond now can you imagine getting a diamond big enough to carve a name in it huh and could you imagine making it like a signet huh you'd have to be a jeweler of some great but you see it doesn't actually mean that in the Hebrew because they had a different substance which was a yellowy substance and um, it was a very valuable stone and it came out of certain um, silicates which were formed in the rock and they carved it out you see but we don't have that now we don't treat it as any value you can go and pick it up in Australia just in the outback and it's um, because you can do that it's no value but it used to have highly polished now in the ancient times in Egypt it was great value and a lot of the signet rings were made with it you see and I think the name of it goes out of my mind right now but there it was but now it's got no value now the writers when they were writing you see you've got to remember that, that when they translated the AV um, they didn't have any chemical research in other words they couldn't tell you well this stone is that because we've done a chemical analysis on it could they they didn't have that kind of scientific information we've got it they didn't have it and therefore a lot of these things have images and have, have truths that they've applied and they've chosen words but actually it didn't apply so we have to realize we won't know everything in fact the further on you go the less you know however there is no doubt about it that they were precious stones and God chose them because each one was a precious stone all I'm drawing to your attention is if you then begin to equate nature with the type of stone that you know you're going to go into tremendous error now you don't need to be a great intelligencer to work out that a diamond to have a name carved in it would be quite a something wouldn't it there are stones that are brittle you hit them and they're, they just shatter you've heard about that have you people spend years looking at these uh, emeralds and diamonds and things and working out whether you should hit it on this side or on this side don't they you ever heard of that men spend years doing fancy doing that working out which side of a stone you're going to take a chisel to and, and they, they spend time doing that because it brings value after they've polished it up now there was no way that those were in you know had um, carvings of names in now you understand what I'm saying all I'm saying is that no one really knows but we have a good idea and I can bring you the Latin names along next week if you want them but you'll be none the wiser nor will I 
because they were valued in their time because they were of use. You see, you could actually make signet rings with them, you could make things, you could write names in them. That's why they became of value, highly pressured, uh, pressure, precious, and they could be polished up beautifully and look beautiful. All right? You got what I'm saying? And the Hebrew words basically have never been defined. You say, well, there are people who speak Hebrew today. There are. But in the Old Testament, there were just those words. Now, it's a mystery. And one of the mysteries I think that was left there was because God knew. I mean, if you ask a Jew where the ark went to, do you ever wonder what happened to the ark? Well, it doesn't tell you. Have you ever wanted to know what happened to the ephod and breastplate? Hmm. You see, he doesn't tell us everything. Now, I know people suppose this happened or suppose that happened. But I don't know, and I dare say you don't. And if you do, well, next week you can come up and explain it to us all. And God bless you. Uh, it isn't in the Bible. And there seems no record in history where, um, you know, you can find these things out. They just seem to have happened. And here we have these stones. Now, the interesting thing is, according to name and nature, you will remember, I don't know if we've got it here tonight. Have we got the tabernacle slides? Oh, they're in the cupboard there. Yes, could we have them? Could we have them, please? Oh, well, Mildred will have to be disturbed, won't she? Yeah. It's the value of coming to a meeting. We disturb everyone. And there, there was a value in the court. Do you remember in the court, God put people in specific positions? Do you remember in the camp? Yes? Who was first amongst the tribe? When they moved camp, struck camp to go. Judah. That's right. And you know, God made an order when they marched and when they were still. There were um... In, in, in this thing, can you open that? I want the one with the cam. I want the one with the cam. Cam. With the names. Okay, well, while he's looking for that, let's hope he gets it soon. Yeah, there you are. There you are. Now, if you remember, or you might not, do you remember this? Everyone remember it? Well, Rob, you weren't here at the time, so how are you going to remember it? You were just a twinkle in Shane's eye when that worked, when we did this. Um, but, well, <laughs> little did you know, if you'd known that, you'd have kept well away, wouldn't you? Um, when, when you get down to this, you see, God organized it that everyone had an exact place in the camp because God's a God of order. And you see, it was absolutely essential that everyone went to their right place. Even, you remember, the Merizites, the Gershonites and the Kohathites all had their different jobs to do. Uh, I don't know if you can remember now. Um, which did what? Who remembers? Pardon? The Kohathites, I haven't left it on there, if I know. No, they were the ones that carried the ark and the holy things, all right? Now, who next do you think would be going? Gershonites, what would they carry? You're reading it, you cheat. It's 
not fair. You're not meant to bring that in, you know. How how many um, how many uh, wagons did they have? The Gershonites actually carried the tents and the coverings. Uh, you got it wrong. Got me worried there. And the <laughs> Merorites carried what? Yeah. You know, how many Mer how many oxen did the Merorites have? Oxen cars? Do you remember four? And the Gershonites had two. All right. Now it's quite simple to remember if you think about it. Just think about it a second, um, because you have to put up the board before you can put the coverings on top, before you can put the stuff inside, don't you? And then you have to take the stuff out and take the coverings off before you can take the frame away. So you don't have to be too intelligent to work that out, do you? She got me worried there because you got it wrong in there, and. Then they had Moses, Jeshurun, and uh, the um, Aaron and his family, of course. And these, of course, you remember, were all the Levites. Oh, it's getting hot there. Um, these were the Levites, uh, all around the inside. And then you had the chief families of Judah, of Reuben, uh, Ephraim, and Dan, and with their other two tribes. And you remember that that was so that it had the warriors, the fighters, on the right round the outside, then you had the workers, and then you had the priesthood right by the en entrance. All right? And that was the way in. Do you all remember that now? See? Now, when they struck camp, uh, they went, and Judah went first, with Issachar and Zebulun. All right? Who came next? Huh? Who came next? Now just think logically. It's totally illogical actually. I'll tell you who came next then. The, the uh, Gershonites came next. And behind the Gershonites um, came the... Uh, Merorites, and then you came to, I've written it all down, you see, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, the three tribes came. So following the, the pillar was the, were the um, tribe of Judah, and then you had the um, two Leviticals who, who carried, um, not the holy things, but they carried the tabernacle, then you had Reuben, who was the firstborn, but had got demoted by this time in God's eyes because of relationship was different. You remember why he got demoted as well, don't you? Bit of indiscretion for one of his father's wives. And um, so you then get uh, the last two, which is Ephraim, and then Dan. So you've got Ephraim, um, Benjamin, and Manasseh. And then you've got Dan, Naphtali, and I can't remember who the other one was. Asia, yeah. Um, and and you, you, you get them moving always in that order. Now, because they moved in that order, strangely enough, that's exactly according to their names or natures that God put them on the ephod on the, uh, the breastplate. It's one of those nights, isn't it? He put them on the breastplate, all right? And um, therefore you would have got three, 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 and three. Or three, 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 and three. Now it doesn't tell you. See? So you don't know. And when they were put like that, and they were sorted out into families, you remember that Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun could get easiest into the tabernacle. Far easier than anyone else. They were nearer coming in. And the further away you went, so faith waned and they were less favored. But they were all precious to God. 
and they all had a specific place to be and God, the whole center of the tabernacle was the thing that set the camp. Without the tabernacle there would have been no camp and no order. And it was always set up in the same way and God always had them camp in the same way. And he had them camp in that way because our God is a God of order. And then when he said according to their names they're to be upon the breastplate, according to their natures, then he had them put upon the breastplate in that way. But that was just because our God is a God of order and of the detail. But there are details which he purposely leaves out. He doesn't say whether it goes that way or it goes that way. He doesn't say whether you start that side or that side. Does he? You see, he leaves mysteries. And it's the details that God excludes that are always important. Remember that um, when we had the uh, coat, the robe of the ephod, what was left out? The material. Now, it explained everything else in detail but never told you the material. Now we have things explained in detail but it never tells you the position. And it doesn't tell you whose name goes with which. Now why? Because it's a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. And you see, everything just isn't explained. That's why I can't explain it. I can tell you what I do know, and then I can tell you what God hasn't given. But there are men who've written books on it, who are very good at conjecture, who explain the whole thing, and I don't believe a word of it. Uh, because if you check the scriptures through, you will discover that there is no validity. But you have to look at the uh, jewels, and um, we've got the sardis, topaz, carbuncle. Now, if you go through them, you will notice that they're all different colors. And you will notice, if you go back to what the Hebrews equivalents were, they were different colors as well. But, no one actually knows exactly what the stones were so I suggest that God in his wisdom and in his majesty and in his great discretion decided that man is always trying to work everything out so he was leaving things there that they couldn't work out and that's good isn't it man loves to be the man of the detail getting every little thing so God hides things in mysteries. And yet, there is great significance. Because, you see, if you look at, the, say, the tabernacle, uh, according to what did they occupy their place? Why did they occupy which place? Well, it happened to be according to function, didn't it? I mean, it's obvious you're going to have the priest right at the door of the tabernacle because they're going to go in. And it's obvious you can have the Levites near the tabernacle because they take it down and put it up and maintain it. All right? And it's obvious you can have the armies around the outside, isn't it? So they were according to function. And on the breastplate, things were according to nature and function as well. God always put things in sensible order according to their function and so you get uh, you get a different value of precious stones every precious stone was a different stone and it had a different name in it and it had its own setting they were set in gold and gold speaks of divinity so they were set in God but they were each different and yet, they were all precious, but some were more precious than others. And this is the mystery. At birth, we all come in the same substance. But, in relationship, and the breastplate covers that part and speaks of that part, which is relationship with the heart. Because you remember, or you might not remember, but I will point it out to you now, so you do remember, uh, uh, 
Would I? Yes, I will. If you turn to the verse... Um, uh, Verse 29, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment. Where? You see, now it all was connected. Heart always speaks in Scripture with relationship. You know, if you find someone says no to you, you're broken hearted. If you're stupid. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, they fall in love, head over heels, or they're broken hearted. And heart and, and emotion and love are always connected, aren't they? Valentine's Day, you might have been one of those silly people who bought a card with a heart with an arrow sticking through it. Um, I hope you didn't. Stupid. Uh, but they, they, we connect it with the heart. And here... Well, it is ridiculous having those silly cards. Um... Uh, oh. See what she did when she was young, can't you? <laughs> hey, Peter. Uh, yeah. yeah, she did. Uh. Oh, they'll grow up. Um, when you come to this heart thing, you see, it says that Aaron bore the names upon his heart when he went into God. So it was all to do with relationship. Now, relationship has different qualities. There are different values. In other words, each stone had a different value in its relationship with God. Aaron spoke of Christ, and it was upon his heart, the heart of Christ, that we are born into the presence of God, because don't forget, this is a picture of the heavenlies. So each one of us has a different value. Now there are twelve settings, because there are twelve tribes. In other words, there are twelve intrinsic natures. But if you take that to too logical a conclusion, you'll go wrong because there are only seven churches and seven spirits to the churches. So it's a figurative number, but it's a number which is absolutely uh, eternal. All right? But don't forget there are four and twenty elders. And there's only four beasts. So don't go too much on numbering. There's 144,000. But they're all figurative numbers made up of many. All right? But the value of each stone was precious, but different. It was different in its type, its quality, its texture, what it was comprised of, how hard or soft it was. You understand what I'm saying? Everyone was different, and everyone had a different name, speaking of nature. But they were all upon Aaron's heart when he went in before God. You understand that? And when Jesus appears before the throne, now you will know that if you have a four square thing on the front of you, it will mean that your heart's over this side and you can kind of get a little away from the heart over that side. You'll still be over the heart, but basically you won't be near the heartbeat, will you? And therefore, we all have different positions. Now, this will be easiest explained if you think about the disciples. Now, they all had different relationships. For instance, you have the 70 who went out, healed the sick, cast out devils, did many miracles. Then you have the 12. And they were closer to Jesus because they were 12 chosen. There was one Iscariot who was the son of perdition who didn't remain one of the 12. And they appointed Matthias, all right? But, and we're coming back to Matthias, very important to remember him, um, but he was one of the twelve, all right? Now, the twelve had a different relationship with Christ than did the seventy. You'd agree with that? All agree with that. Now, out of that twelve, he chose three to go up the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, the three had a different relationship with Christ from the other nine. You see, he chose Peter, James, and John. And up they went, up the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't take the other nine. Did he? 
Now, why he didn't take them? Because they had a different heart relationship with Christ than did the others. Now, they were precious, but their relationship was on a different level. You understand what I'm saying? And therefore, they only went to a certain level. Then, you see, you go beyond that, the three, to the one. There was only one John who leant on Jesus' breast at supper and was described the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he was the only one that dare ask Jesus who it was who was going to betray him. Because he was the only one who had that really deep, secure relationship. Peter didn't dare ask. He asked John to ask. Because he knew John had a deeper relationship than he did in that realm of relationship. But they were all equal upon the shoulders. You understand what I'm saying now? Their birth equal, their relationship's different. Their depth of relationship is different. They were all part of the bride of Christ, but they were different depths. And we need to understand that what God's trying to say to us is, okay, there are many, many, many depths of relationship. Or there are different heavens. Or there are different many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Remember these were all set in their place upon the breastplate. Do you understand what I'm saying? So everything is related. Now you can't change your nature in the sense that when you're born again you receive and become a partaker of the divine nature, but that is blended with something within you. And that can only be uh, refined and developed as your relationship with Christ deepens. We're changed from glory to glory and in the face of Jesus Christ. Now John was called the son of thunder. Do you remember? Son of Zebedee, son of thunder with James, and he was for calling down fire from heaven upon the Samaritan village. Do you remember that? When Jesus went by. And yet, at the end of his days, it was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he had developed, and he would got the nature change. Beyond birth, he had gone on in nature change until he had become what you could say is a favourite. What I would call the favourite, but not in human terms. Now, he developed, and we can all develop. Now, actually, you can actually change your nature. And you can change your position in the heavenly by relationship you can graduate up but and here's the but about it you always were what you will be because God foreknew what you'd, you'd attain to but you have to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Not as though you had already attained, either were made perfect. Though it was done before the foundation of the world, you've got to attain to that measure that Christ has fitted you for. And if you fail to attain to that measure for which you were fitted, which is by developing relationship, you will lose your rewards. You see, that is why he talks about one man's given one talent, one man two talents, one man five talents. Each one has to develop within the talents that he's given in his basic um, investment. Do you understand what I'm saying? Each one of you has an investment. God gives you a talent. All right, you've got to make two talents. That's your job. God gives another man three talents. He's got to make six. Now, God always will stretch you to the limit of your capacity. Now, it's true to say that each individual has different capacities according to their genetic endowment. And your genetic endowment, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, is that which you receive from your forebears and is corrected at new birth. 
Now that genetic endowment means that genetically you're pre-programmed. But then your pre-programming has to be used by you in such a way that you develop to your full potential in God. Do you understand what I'm saying or is it too much for you? Alright, so each one has, ha, you have what's called a genetic endowment. Now you will know, it, or you won't know, but if you do psychology, you will know that everyone has a genetic endowment. And lunatic educationists don't believe it. Um, so you don't believe lunatic educationists, do you? Um, they believe if you put the environment, make the environment, it's the same for everyone. This is the socialist. This is the evil, wicked socialism that I hate with every part of my body because it goes against God's teaching. And they say that everyone's equal. Well, it's not true. You see, no one's equal. They can't be because God's made them different. And if God's made them different, they're not equal. And God has foreordained and predestinated them. Some to honour, some to dishonour, some to life eternal and some to destruction. Now, you cannot say they're all equal when God says they're not. He said, I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful, says God. How dare someone stand up and say that everyone's got equal opportunity? Of course they haven't. And you'll know that it, when a person's born, uh, you can put them in a different environment, but their genetic endowment will govern their development in life. You can take a man, and it's been done in America, you can take a, a, a child out of a criminal parentage and you can put them in a good home and they'll turn out a criminal. <coughs> and you can take a criminal, um, you can take a good child out of a good home and good parentage and put him in the wrong environment and he'll turn out good. Why? Because of his genetic endowment. Now psychologists have proved it. I was reading a paper on it by, uh, I can't remember, I think it was a uh, um, I can't remember. I, I lent it to Ed. I said, look at that. Um, it, it was um, a paper by these great, great men, you know, silly people, uh, who'd spent 20 years studying this, criminals in, in, in uh, prisons. And they'd taken these criminals and they'd proved that genetically those people were programmed and there was no way they had a conscience or a feeling of guilt. It wasn't in their genetic makeup. And they were hardened criminals. And that's the way it is. There are some people that are just born to it. And there are other people who, from the day of their birth, have a sensitive conscience. Maybe you're one of those sensitive ones. You're just not that way. There's that in you that will give you away. You know what I mean, don't you? There's some people that, that just could do anything and they can get away with it. But if you try to do it, you, 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 your conviction inside gives you away. And that is your genetic endowment what you're born with. Now, it's also true that uh, you needn't develop to the full potential of it. But in God, you see, we all have a birth which is equal. But then we have that intrinsically within us that we had from our first birth and then we have to develop the full potential of that in God. In a relationship with Christ. Now, that varies for every person. And you see, God could have worked it in generations ago. And it's part of you. That is why the genealogy of Jesus Christ is very interesting. You look 
of the lineage that Jesus Christ came by. And you'll see that there were some surprising people in that lineage that you would have thought shouldn't be there. But they're there. And you see, they all worked in something into that life. And that's a mystery. And God is very careful about your parentage. It wasn't by accident that you had the parents you had. God ordained it. And your forebears, you go back, you'll find that God will have ordained it and there'll be a line, there'll be a thread of faith running through. You might not realize it, but God's at work. Before your mother and father were born, back generations, he's at work. And you see there's the seed of God in the earth and there's the seed of the devil and then there's the uncommitted seed which either becomes the nation of the saved or the lost. It could be either. And, and there's the elect of God and then there's just the generation of people and then there's the seed of the devil. And those seeds are worked right throughout the whole of the world. And everyone intrinsically is partaken of those seeds. That's why there are elect, those are people in the church who, well, they'll be saved whatever happens. They're, they're just preordained. You know, they can do the most outrageous things, but they'll be saved and come through and go into ministry. <laughs> That's it. They, they just can't fail. They're the elect. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, and they weren't born. There was Jacob the twister. Look at him. He, he lusted after the wrong wife and ended up with Leah. Now that was a twisting of Laban, wasn't it? Do you remember the story? And yet, if he hadn't got Leah and, and Laban hadn't twisted it, Christ's line wouldn't have come. Because it was out of Leah that the line of Christ came. And yet God promoted the younger over the older in order to do that. Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim was blessed, not Manasseh. You remember the story? They were both the sons of Joseph. You remember that God said of Joseph that he would have a double portion because he'd gone in and he'd been faithful to God in the land. That's why Joseph's name's left out of the breastplate, but he had two in, Ephraim and Manasseh. And you'll find the other one who was left out, of course, was, was Levi, because they took on the priesthood. They were set apart from the children for the priesthood. That's why you get those changes there in the breastplate. But you understand that there is a great development that you are capable of but it's limited according to your genetic endowment and that's that now it's a mystery but that's the way it is folks and you can take it or leave it and you can like it or lump it but that's the way it is now I cannot understand why God calls some and they seem to go in a ministry and he'll call others who can fast and pray and wait on God and push themselves and they'll get nowhere. I don't know. I look at some and I think they're deserving, they're not. And yet it's the ones that are not that get there. The ones that deserve it don't get it. The ones who have all the right qualifications in human terms God totally ignores and yet the ones who are all wrong somehow develop a relationship they've got a secret well it's in the quality you see and that's the way it is and no one can ever explain it you just have to accept that's how God is he chooses whom he will and he's good at it why does he do it that way well who art thou, O man, that answers to guess God? 
Can the vessel say to the potter, why hast thou made me so? But that's how our human heart often does. Why is it God made me like this? Well, because he made you like that. Now you've got to learn to be happy being what you are. A mature man, or a man who's coming into spiritual maturity, isn't a man who's entered into ministry, or a man who hasn't entered into a ministry. He is a man who is content to be what he is. That is a mature man. A misfit is someone who's always trying to be what he isn't. But the mature man in the spirit is someone who is content to be what he is in God and develop in that which he is. So if I'm on this side of the breastplate, it's no good me trying to get to that side if I'm going to be this side. But I don't know that I'm going to be that side. I can develop to my full potential, you see. And I could change and go up. I don't know. That's why God didn't give any positions. Because they can change. But don't worry. Whom he foreknew, them he predestinated. So he knows exactly how far you'll go, so you've got your little niche. He's got that little place for you, just where you're going to get to. And you'll scrape there by the skin of your teeth, somehow. And you'll think, whoa, I really did well. And you will have done well. You'll have finished the course. And you'll have gone to the potential that you've been able to achieve. And God will have known it all the time. But he likes to leave a bit of something for you to attain to. That's why Paul said, Not though I had already attained, I'm pressing on towards the mark of the prize that I call him. And there's the greatest apostle of them all. Still pressing on down the road. I mean, when he's finished the course, he's still running. It's not one of these people that collapses at the end with no breath left. He was still going down the road. And, and God called him and he just ran straight in the glory like Enoch. I mean, you know, they, they were on their way. But it was relationship. Paul was writing at the end of his life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wanted that relationship with Christ. I want to know him. And you see, it's got to become a cry within your being. Now, according to your nature, you'll develop your relationship so far and no further. But God will bring into your life, every step you go, he'll bring into your life opportunities to develop that relationship in a deeper way. If you take that next step, then he'll give you another one and another one. The day you step, stop stepping is the day you get stopped and cut off. That's the point you reach, and you won't never go above that. But, you can go all the way. That's your potential. But not many of you will make it. That's the truth. But, you have opportunity to make it. Because you won't. But you could. But he already foreknows where you will. Now it's up to you how far you go. That's why it's all a mystery. It's good it's a mystery, isn't it? Great is the mystery of godliness. Hmm? All based on relationship. Now, if you look with me, then, we'll go on uh, to 2 Corinthians. Just keep your thumb where you were. Um, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9.
Look, look what Paul says in verse, let's take verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now here's Paul say, I'm willing to leave this body and be present with the Lord. But then listen to what he goes on to say. Wherefore we labour or endeavour that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. Now the word in the Greek for that accepted of him is maybe that we can please him. Now you remember the story of Esther. Do you remember the story of Esther? What did she want to do? What pleased the king? And this is the same thing, you see. It's a love relationship. Esther's the bride, of course, to the king. And you remember the Holy Spirit was working upon Esther in... Um, oh, dear. Begins with H. It's gone right out of my mind now. It'll come back in a minute. Um, hey, guy. No. Hey, guy. No, no. Anyway, Hagen. Haman. That's it. Haman. Haman, you got that right. Um, Haman, uh, who was the king's um, chamberlain. Do you remember that? Um, name went right out of my mind. Um, oh, that's right. What are you doing? I'll have to look it up. I can't remember. No, not Mordecai. Who on earth? What? No, I don't want the man who got hung. I want the man who was the king's chamberlain. Pardon? He guy. I was right in the third. That's what I said. Who told me I was wrong? George, go to the bottom of the class. Couldn't do this in a normal church, as if you were irreverent, wouldn't they? <laughs> or irrelevant. Um, anyway, here he is. He said, I want to be pleasing. Um, and I want to be accepted of him. I want to please him. And you see, we must endeavour always to please Jesus Christ to the limit of our abilities. In other words, you must be stretched. One of the problems is my little daughter, she goes to a school, it's an infant school, and the problem is they don't stretch her abilities. So she's bored, really, and she's far more intelligent, but they won't stretch her abilities. Bad school. Everyone needs to be stretched. You need to be stretched. Don't you feel much more content when you do a job and your capabilities are really stretched and tried and, and there's something about succeeding and finding you can do it and achieving something and you feel the satisfaction and fulfilment in that, don't you? But if you're not stretched, you don't feel fulfilled and you can't explain why you're not fulfilled but you just know you're not. You understand what I mean? And it's the same thing. You see, your fulfilment in Christ comes out of going to the ultimate, being stretched beyond, right to the edge of your capabilities. Now when you do that, you expand your capabilities. For instance, I know that um, it's possible, you say let's take physical fitness, you will know that a runner trains for running a certain distance. Now he trains himself and trains his body he can stretch his body beyond what anyone else's body can do because he's trained it that way. Or a boxer. A boxer trains his body and he trains his reflexes so that he can move out of the way of a punch or put a punch in quickly and a jab in and duck out the way. And all his reflexes are highly trained and attuned, aren't they? And he develops his stomach muscles so people can punch him and it doesn't hurt. Well, it doesn't hurt that much. And he can train himself so and get his neck muscles strong so that if he takes a punch on the jaw, he doesn't get his neck thrown back and, and knocked out. I mean, he develops himself. But if a man who's untrained went in there and got a punch on the jaw, could kill him, break his neck. Because 
you know, he's not trained to it, and a man with real power doing it, who wants trained, could do him a lot of damage. And we need to attune ourselves and get trained in pleasing him. And get stretched and stretched. And as we get stretched, we develop. That's why Paul talks about it. He says, I'm confident, you know, whether at present or absent. But he said, I, I want to endeavour. Do you understand the meaning of what I'm saying? And it's all with, to do with relationships. Now, most people who are Christians in the evangelical mode, once they've got to the basis of, of new birth, they don't bother about relationship. It's not talked about or understood. They always come on the basis of the shoulder. They never come on the basis of the breastplate. They don't even see the necessity of it. I must develop my relationship with him to be one of his precious jewels. That is the call of God. And in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, I get stirred up when I think about it, don't you? It, it, it's something that challenges you. Oh, well, it does me. You can see that there's so much in God to go. If only you go there. The trouble is, you've got to stir yourselves up, haven't you? Stir up the gift that's in you, Paul wrote to Timothy. You know, gird up the loins of your mind. Get on. There's got to be a going in and pressing on. Uh, and that's a vital thing to get into your person. The, the trouble is with England, that there's lethargy. And the trouble with people is they're lethargic. They won't do things. They haven't got a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. You've got to have a vision to go in the God. You've got to have a vision that you can go right into the very depths of God. And you've got to have a heart to get there. And if God doesn't give it to you, you'll never have it. And that's the way it is. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we read this in... Um, Hello. I've lost where I what I want to say. Um, yeah, it is. Um, verse nine. Um, says, for I am least of all the uh, least of the apostles that have not been to be called apostle because I um, persecuted the church of God but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain but I laboured more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God that, which was with me now it's not us it's the grace of God that's with us. But it is us. Because it's by His grace that we labour. And we wouldn't have any desire to labour if it weren't for His grace. Do you understand that? You wouldn't have any desire to believe if it wasn't for the grace of God. You wouldn't have any desire to please if it wasn't for the grace of God. But you've got to labour as far as your understanding allows. And as you labour, so God will increase your understanding so you can labour more. Alright? Now it says also in this passage, and I can't find it because I just don't... My eye doesn't drop on it. Um, um, ah, yes, there you are. 40, 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Now, there, you have a celestial body and you have a terrestrial body. But that is a mystery. There is one glory of the sun and, an and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. 
For one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Now Paul said, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, you all understand, have a body celestial. But the place to which you reach, and the mansion that's prepared for you, which is the tabernacle, will differ in glory. They all differ in glory. But according to your relationship development. You all look blank. Do you understand what I'm saying or not? No, well, there you are. If you don't understand, don't worry. God bless you. And let's go on then. Okay? We want to go on to the next thing. That's as far as I can explain it, and that's as far as I feel God wants me to explain it. And if you grasp what I'm saying, God bless you, and if you haven't, well, Lord bless you too. And then it comes on to say, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of, of judgment, and don't forget this is the breastplate of judgment. And might I say, that because it's the breastplate of judgment, remember that in Peter it says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Do you remember that? To receive a reward for what we've done. Every man sees a recompense and reward for what he's done. Or, to put it another way, for the relationship to which he's attained to, or how well pleasing he's been to the king. All right? All of us do that. And then we go on to say that uh, thou shalt put in them the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now there's the Urim and the Thummim. Now, here's a mystery. It doesn't tell you what they are. Now you can search the scriptures and you won't find out what they are, so I'll tell you. By showing you. But it is a mystery and I can only show you to a degree. But uh, the Urim, uh, which is the first one, means light. And the Thummim means perfections in the Hebrew. But, you see, light and perfections actually means conviction and innocence. Now, it's interesting to know that, uh, let's take Revelation 11, 17. Okay, we'll just go quickly to, I think probably... You probably have more than you can stand. Someone there holding his head. Um, it's all right. Um, <laughs> Revelation 11.
Give me just a minute. Okay, I'll go to Ezra. Ezra is easier. Um, see, the, the things that come to my mind that I can't always put my hand on. If you turn to Ezra, um, and it's interesting in Ezra chapter 2, Verse 61. Okay, have you found it? You find it near ne Nehemiah, just before. Or after Chronicles. Okay, got it. Ezra, chapter 2, and verse 61 says this. And the children of the priests, the children of... Hebiha, the children of Koz, the children of Barzilliah, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzilliah, oh dear, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. These sought to register those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were as polluted, put from the priesthood, and... Uh, the Tarshathar said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and with Thummim. Now, the Urim and Thummim were two stones and there was one which was the white stone. You remember it's the story of Jesus said to him that overcome it for like give the white stone with a name written in which no man readeth. And that is the Thummim. All right. Now the Urim and Thummim were the means of judgment. That's why it was called the breastplate of judgment. So when God wanted to speak to the people, or they could ask any question of God, and the high priest could go to the ephod and take out the Urim or Thummim, and that would give them the answer of whether it was yes or no. But always there was only the answer yes or no. In other words, you couldn't ask for an explanation. You had to phrase it in such a way that the answer demanded only a yes or a no. And that was in the priesthood. Because you remember, um, now you can find the same story in Nehemiah 7, 63 to 65. You can find the same story in uh, 1 Samuel 14, 40, 1 Samuel 23, 6, 9 to 12, uh, 1 Samuel 30, verses 7 and 8 or Joshua 7, 13 to 18. And you will find instances of the Urim and Thummim being used, you see. I've just given you examples. Now always, it was getting a decision from God. Now let's take um, the obvious one. We'll take Joshua. We'll go there, eh? 7. Joshua 7. And um, here's Joshua. Now he desires an answer from the Lord. Okay, verse 13. Hello, that's funny. Oh, that's because I'm in the wrong chapter. Sure. Um, now, they get beaten, you remember. And they can't understand why they got beaten at AI. Do you remember that? They go up. Right. Verse 13. Up, sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. Now they had to sort out who was the guilty party. So they came. And as they came, the priest took out the urine or the thumbing to say whether they were innocent or guilty. Now first they did it by tribes and the lot fell on Judah, uh, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, so Joshua rose up early, verse 16, in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. The urine came out for the tribe of Judah. All right? Now they still want to find out who's the accursed, so they've got to find out by their families. 
so he brought the, um, the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zarephites and he brought the family of the um, Zarites man by man and um, Zabdi was taken so now he's gone and they've gone through the process again with the high priest taking out the Urim or Thummim and now they've found out and they've wheedled it down to the family alright back they go now they could only answer a guilty or innocent so they, they're narrowing it down now that was the way that the priestly office functioned you see it was before the time of the prophets because they had refused at Mount Sinai to have the spirit of prophecy upon them so God gave them the priesthood now he would have dwelled amongst them as prophets but at this dispensation and under the legalistic state he couldn't come that way so he always instituted a way where man could relate that is why you'll get lots of legalistic people who are always sticking out fleeces and have to put before God a yes or a no well if you want me to do that God do this or that well they're in the urine and some in the they haven't got into relationship at all in that sense okay um, and so here they are now they're judged alright let's go on and he bought his household man by man and Achan the son of Carmi the son of Zabdi the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken and Joshua said unto Achan my son give I pray thee glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him and tell me now what thou hast done hide it not from me now the Urim and Thummim have been used to wheel it out to the family and man by man to the actual man is guilty now Joshua says now tell me what you've done and of course Achan admits that he, he took um, treasures and spoil doesn't he do you remember and he hidden them in his tent now that method was foolproof because it was God ordained now it's interesting to note if you're interested that um, Saul does exactly the same thing do you remember when uh, the story with, with uh, when um, Jonathan took a stick and took honey and ate it do you remember and he pronounced the curse and then Saul says right God now choose between the transgression is it, is it the people or is it Jonathan and I and they, get, they call for the ephod now the ephod always has the breastplate of judgment attached to it it was never taken off it so immediately they go in and it turns out that it's Saul and Jonathan so then he says alright now choose between Jonathan and I and of course the thing fell on Jonathan and then it, of course Jonathan confessed he took the honey and his father says he must die but you remember the people of Israel saved Jonathan because he was valiant in battle remember the story? Um, so there you are you see now do you remember the other story Abishar came came the high priest came and what did he bring to David do you remember Ephod then David said the um, Kehalites uh, are they going to betray me and deliver me into Saul's hand or aren't they now the first time he asked a question and I pointed out to you he asked three questions and he only got one answer then he had to go back to God and ask the next because you see you can only get one answer at a time that way you follow that was what the urine and something was now what they actually were what type of stones they were the Bible doesn't tell us whether they were round oblong square doesn't tell us all it tells us is it was kept in the breastplate of judgment tells us how it was used and that's it that's all we know and that's the way it was used you all follow that? Hmm? Sure? Simple, isn't it? Simple. Simple. And now you see, the reason that we don't need that now is for one simple reason. We have the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. Now you you will find that the ephod and that means of judgment fell into disuse 
and fell out of favor when they got to the place of um, King David. As King David went on, he got out of using the ephod uh, in that way. But while there was the apostate, and while there were people backsliding, they needed that method because their relationship with God was lost. But whilst they walk in that relationship, which they should be, near to his heart, then you will find he'll speak to them. And you don't need this yes, no. Shall I, shan't I? When someone's got to this stage, well, if it's your will for, to do this or that, Lord, then show me by doing this, open this door or close that door. What it means is they're using the urine and thumbing. In other words, they haven't got relationship. Because when you're in covenant relationship, you're doing what's well-pleasing to the king. And you know he causes us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And therefore, you're in a different relationship area. Now, the urine and thumbing was always dealt with and, and used when people have gone into apostasy. All right? You understand what I'm saying, do you? Uh, when the people, I'm talking about the people of Israel had. Now, of course, if we live and walk with the Lord, and we walk close to him, then how many of you come to church and you find that God somehow in a meeting gives you the answer when you're not looking for it? You suddenly find, well, yeah, I know exactly what I should do, because somehow it just comes to you, clear as anything. That's because the spirit of prophecy is moving, you see, and God will then convict and show you the way to walk. Now, that is a mature way to walk when you're walking in relationship. Well, you could fall out of relationship, then you'd have to go back to the basic use of um, uh, is it your will or isn't it? Show me. That's not a mature way to walk. Uh, that's the babe's way. And it's the way of just the shoulder, not the heart and relationship. All right? Now, do you all understand what I've said and follow? Now you all know what the urine and thumb is. Alright? And it's all a mystery. God left out the details of exactly what they were. And do you know why he did that? Because he knew that if he'd put it in, silly man would have tried to get imitation. I mean, look at the Anglican church. They, they actually deck their priests in fancy clothes, don't they? So do the Catholics. Blasphemy. Um, and so God made things complex so people couldn't understand. Left details out so they'd get it wrong anyway. Because that's our great God. He's so gracious that he makes sure man can't work it out in his natural reason. So he never told us what the urine and thumb was. But it is interesting to note that when Jesus ascended to glory and he left his disciples by, they took two apostles, two would-be apostles, and they drew lots, because that was the way of the children of Israel to divine the will of God. So it was the natural thing they'd revert to, because that was the way they were taught by their forefathers when the spirit of prophecy wasn't there and there was indecision, they used lots. When they didn't know what the will of God was. Now they prayed and said, Lord, show us what the will of God is. Do you follow? So it's only, it's a thing that even the, the disciples use. But once the Spirit had come down upon them, they never resorted to that method. They knew by divine revelation. And so the testimony of Jesus as the Spirit of prophecy negates the use of that. Now you understand what I'm saying, do you? Although, Jesus is our great high priest and he will still use that method to teach him. If you're not walking in relationship with him. They're still there in heaven. But you don't want the wrong one, do you? You don't want urine coming up. Bring conviction. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that within your word are held so many secrets. There's so many beautiful illustrations, O oh God. 
There are so many wonderful things that are mysteries in you. Thank you, Lord, that you've hidden them from the wise and the prudent. And you've revealed them unto the simple of heart. Lord, we want to develop a relationship with you. Close to your heart. We want to be those people that please you. And are well pleasing to our King. Teach us, O oh Lord, just how to develop that relationship. Lord, bring it about in our hearts and minds. We thank you for what you've been doing over these last few days. The great shift of light that's come. But, oh God, we want to go on into relationship. We go, want to go on loving you and praising you and be knowing you. Dear Lord Jesus, touch each heart and life. Lord, just write the truth that you want heard in the hearts of those that have heard. It's so difficult sometimes to put into words what you show. But, oh God, by the Holy Ghost, take the mean and frail words and just write them in people's hearts, oh God. Give them understanding. Lord Jesus, and may we be those that desire and seek and follow after a relationship with you. We pray in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. Amen.